Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry, Holmes. No, no. You couldn't have come at a better time. Well, I was, I was afraid you were engaged. I am, very much so. Dr. Watson shares my love of all that is bizarre and outside the routine of everyday existence. It is at present impossible for me to say whether this case is an instance of crime or no. But suffice it to say that I know as little about Mr. J. Bears Wilson as you do yourself, beyond the obvious facts. That he has done manual labor at some time, that he takes snuff, that he has been to China, and that he has done a considerable amount of writing lately. How in the name of good fortune did you know all that, Mr. Holmes? Yeah, true as gospel, I once did manual labor. I started off as a, a ship's carpenter. Your hands, my good sir. The muscles of your right hand are more developed than the left. And the writing? What else could be indicated by the right cuff so very shiny for five inches? And the uh, left sleeve with the smooth patch near the elbow where you lean it on the desk. But China, the fish, 
tattooed immediately above his right wrist. I have made a small study of tattoo marks, Mr. Wilson, and have even contributed to the literature of the subject. That trick of staining the fish scales, a delicate pink, is quite peculiar to China. When, in addition, I see a Chinese coin hanging from his watch chain, the matter becomes even more simple. Well, I never. I thought at first it was something clever, but now I see there's nothing in it after all. <laughs> oh. <laughs> now I begin to think that my reputation, such as it is, will suffer shipwreck if I'm so candid. Omne ignotum pro magnifico. Everything becomes commonplace by explanation. Watson, that is a very loose translation. Oh, please, show the doctor that advertisement. Oh. There, you can read it for yourself, sir. To the red-headed Lee. On account of the bequest of the late Ezekiah Hopkins of Lebanon, Pennsylvania, USA, there is a vacancy open which entitles a member of the League to a salary of four pounds a week for purely nominal services. All red-headed men, sound in body and mind, and above the age of 21 are eligible. Apply in person on Monday at 11 o'clock to Mr. Duncan Ross at the offices of the League, 7 Pope's Court, Fleet Street. Is this serious? <laughs> it is a little off the beaten track, eh, Watson? Oh, would you make a note of the paper and the date? Ah. Evening standard of Saturday the 27th of April, two months ago. Yeah. Oh, do try the city. Now! Mr. Wilson, off you go at scratch and tell us all about yourself. Oh. Oh. Well, gentlemen, I have a small pawnbroking business in Saxe Coburg Street, uh, near the city. It's not a very large affair, it just gives me a living. I used to keep uh, two assistants, but uh, now I just keep the one. And to tell you the truth, I'd have a job to make it pay, but that he's willing to come at half wages so as to learn the business. About two months ago... What is the name of this obliging youth? Vincent. Uh, Vincent Spaulding. Oh, and he's not such a youth either, Mr. Holmes. He's difficult to say his age, but I couldn't wish for a smarter assistant. You seem most remarkably fortunate in having an employé who comes under the market price. I don't know that your assistant is not as remarkable as your advertisement. <laughs> oh, but he does have his faults. And I never was there such a fellow for photography, always snapping away with his camera when he should be improving his mind and then diving down into the cellar to develop the wretched thing. Still, on the whole, he's a good worker and no vice in him. It was he who first showed me the advertisement. I wish to the Lord I was a red headed man, Mr. Wilson. Why is that? Well, there's another vacancy in the League of Red Headed Men. <laughs> I've never heard of it. <laughs> well, I'd wonder at that. You being so eligible yourself. Nice money, too. A couple of hundred a year. And the work's slight. Ah, oh, there'd be thousands of red-headed men to play. Oh, well, I doubt that, sir. Well, not with such a fine, fiery colour as you are blessed with, Mr Wilson. <laughs> but then I suppose it's hardly worth your while to put yourself out of the way for the sake of a few hundred pounds. Yes, sir. Well, I'm very much of a stay-at-home sort of person. Sometimes weeks on end without putting my foot over the doormat. But this, it, it looked interesting. I was intrigued. And young Vincent said he'd come with me. So, uh, on Monday morning, we shut up the shop and uh, off we went. Now, Vincent, let's go back. I can't abide a crowd. Courage, Mr Wilson. We're so near and so much at stake. You pull your collar up. Hello, Jimmy. Come along with me. What's the job all about then? Oh, well, it's the time they made it, wasn't it? The two months. Oh, yeah.
Get out of it! Hey, get out! Hey, Jock, you know he's killing him! Excuse us! Hey, you! Hey, you! Hey, you! Right, off you go. You're next. Get in. Wait, where are you going? Straight this way, huh? Come on. This is Mr. Wilson. Right, in you go, Mr. Wilson. Good night, Saturday. Come on, Get back, get back, get back. 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 Very fine. <laughs> Congratulations, <laughs> Mr. Wilson. It would be injustice to hesitate. You will, I'm sure, excuse me if I take an obvious precaution. <laughs> Tears in your eyes. I perceive all is as it should be. We have to be careful. Twice deceived by wigs, once by paint. I can tell you tales of cobbler's wax. It would disgust you with human nature. My name is Duncan Ross. I am myself a pensioner upon the fund left by a noble benefactor. Ah, I see you're about to question me about Mr. Ezekiah Hopkins. He was himself red-headed. In his youth, he left London for America, where he made many millions of dollars. On his death, it was found, he had instructed the trustees in his will to <laughs> make life a little easier for the red-headed men in the time of his birth. <laughs> Wonderful colouring. Now, what's your full name, Mr. Wilson? Jabez Wilson. Jabez Wilson. And uh, are you a married man, uh, Mr. Wilson? Do you have a family? No, I'm a widower. No, I, I, I never had any family. Oh, dear. Sad to hear you say that. The fund, of course, was for the propagation and spread of red-headed men, as well as for their maintenance. In another case, the objection might be fatal. However, I think we've got to stretch a point in favor of a man with such a head of hair as yours. Vacancy has been filled. start upon your new duties. Oh, well, it is rather awkward, as I do have a business already. What would be the hours? Ten till two. Well, the mornings are quiet. Now, I do have an assistant. Yes, that would suit me very well. And the money mentioned, four pounds a week. Correct. And the work? Purely nominal. Yes, well, what do you call purely nominal? Well, you have to stay in the office, or at least in the building the whole time. If you leave, you forfeit your whole position forever. The will is quite clear in that point. Oh, I shouldn't dream of leaving. No excuse will avail, neither sickness, business, nor anything else. Here you will remain, or else lose your billet. Oh, no, I am quite clear on that point, but what exactly is the work? It is to copy out the Encyclopedia Britannica. There is the first volume. You will supply the ink, paper and pen. We will supply this desk and chair. Now, would you be free to start next Monday morning? Oh, yes, certainly. <laughs> then, once again, my congratulations, Mr. Jabez Wilson, on the most important position you've been fortunate enough to gain. <laughs> Wonderful head of hair. Mm. Goodbye, Mr. Wilson. <laughs> well done, Mr. Wilson. Well done, indeed. <laughs> this is the quickest way out, sir. Oh, no. This way. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs>
When I got home, the whole thing seemed, on reflection, to be quite ridiculous. Why? Who would make such an extraordinary will? Not a very generous millionaire to make you buy your own pen, ink and paper. Well, exactly, Mr. Holmes. I soon persuaded myself it was some great hoax or fraud. Then when Monday morning came along, it did seem stupid to turn down a good job, so, um... Off I went and bought a penny bottle of ink and a pen and seven sheets of foolscap paper and uh, I set off for Pope's court. Well, to my surprise and delight, everything was as right as possible. The table was set out ready for me, and Mr. Duncan Ross was there to see I got fairly to work. My employment had truly begun. The schedule never varied. My work started at 10 o'clock and uh, ended at 2 o'clock, uh, with a small break for my lunch at half past 12. Every Saturday at 2 o'clock, uh, Mr. Ross would come in and give me my money, I see. compliment me upon the amount that I'd written, and then we'd both leave, Mr. Ross locking the door after yes. me. Uh, artichokes, I found, but one was simply yes. fascinating, you know. They, they have a kind of a bloom on them, but uh, sure. Annibal, I also thought, was A, but he was H after yes. all. I thought that yes. was very interesting. Good morning. Oh, the work was very interesting. Abacus, Abbey, architecture, Acts of the Apostles, adulteration, anatomy, apes, aqueducts. After eight weeks, I'd fairly dealt with the letter A and was hoping with diligence to get on to B when suddenly this morning the whole business came to an end. I went to my work as usual, but the door was shut and locked with a little square of cardboard hammered onto the middle panel. Oh, excuse me. Have you seen Mr Duncan Ross this morning? Ross? Ross? Never heard of a gentleman of that name, sir. And my memory's good. It's, it's very good. It's infallible for names. Ah, the gentleman at number seven. Ah, the gentleman who is red-headed. Yes, ah, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Gone. Gone? Mr William Morris, a solicitor using my room as a temporary convenience until his new premises were ready. Moved out yesterday. Paid him full. Doesn't owe a penny. William Morris? Where can I find him? Well, at his new offices. William Morris, number 17 King Edward Street. Near St Paul's. Oh, thank you. See, there's anything very funny about it. <laughs> if all you can do is laugh at me, well, I can go elsewhere. No, Mr. Wilson, please, please sit down. I wouldn't miss this case for the world. It is most refreshingly unusual. <gasps> I was so incensed at the fraudulent deceit that I came straight to you, sir. Having heard of your great reputation for helping poor people in distress. Oh, Mr. Wilson. You know, Mr. Wilson, I really don't think that you've got any great grievance against this extraordinary league. On the contrary, you've been very well paid, to say nothing of the detailed knowledge which you've acquired on every subject under the letter A. 
Yes, but, but what's the object of the playing this prank on me? That, that's what I want to know. This assistant of yours, how long has he been with you? Well, about three months. How did he come? When well, he answered to an advertisement. Was he the only applicant? No, I had 12 others. Why did you pick him? Well, he, he was handy and would come cheap. At half wages, in fact. Yes. What's he like? This Vincent Spaulding. Hmm? Oh, well, he's tall. He's slightly built. <laughs> he's very quick in his ways. He's got no hair on his face. He's got a white splash of acid on his forehead. <laughs> Uh, have you ever observed whether his ears have been pierced for earrings? Yes! Yeah, he told me a gypsy had done it for him when he was a lad. Yes. He is still with you? Yes. Yeah, I would have just left him. Mr. Wilson. You will be at your shop if I should need you. Yeah, well, well, I had thought of shutting up shop at dinner time today because uh, Vincent had suggested <coughs> I spend the rest of the weekend with my sister embarking. This whole business has upset my nerves very much. Will you enjoy a restful weekend in Bath? Today is Saturday. By Monday, we should have a conclusion for you. In the matter of your fee? Don't worry about that. I believe it will be paid for by another. Good day to you, Mr. Woods. What do you make of it all, Watson? I make nothing of it. It's the most mysterious business. So yet there are graver issues hanging from this affair than at first sight appear. What are you going to do? To smoke. It is quite a three-pipe problem. And I beg that you won't speak to me for 50 minutes. Business of the Red Headed League is concluded, sir. Satisfactorily, I trust. Most satisfactorily, Professor. I'm pleased to report. Good. told you that. No doubt, Watson. What is it? And why did you beat the pavement with your stick? Watson, we are spies in an enemy's territory. to have an exact knowledge of London now. There is Mortimer's, the tobacconist, 
the little uh, newspaper shop, mm -hmm. Coburg Branch, the city and suburban bank. McFarlane's carriage building depot and the vegetarian restaurant around the corner. Watson, commit to memory. It is just possible that we're being observed. A considerable crime is in contemplation. Today, being Saturday, somewhat complicates matters. But now, Doctor. Our work is done. It is time we had some play. Sarasati is playing at the St. James's Hall this afternoon. A sandwich and a cup of coffee? And then off to violin land, where all is sweetness, delicacy and harmony. And no red-headed clients to vex us with their conundrums. All the afternoon, he sat in the stalls, wrapped in the most perfect happiness, while his gently smiling face and his languid, dreamy eyes were as unlike those of Holmes the sleuth hound as it was possible to conceive. When I saw him, so enwrapped in the music, I felt that an evil time might be coming upon those whom he had set himself to hunt down. as a cartographer. Uh, that'll be Thelny Jones. I thought it was as well to have someone from Scotland Yard with us. He's an absolute imbecile at his profession, but he does have the tenacity of a lobster when he gets his claws into someone. Good evening, Jones. So, we're working in couples again, Mr. Holmes. Our friend here is a wonderful man for starting a chase. All he needs is an old dog to help him do the running down. Mr. Merriweather, my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? I only hope a wild goose may not prove to be the end of our chase. I'm not personally in favor of amateur criminal investigators. You may place considerable confidence in Mr. Holmes. No, oh, if you say so, Mr. Jones. Well, he has his own little methods, which, if he won't mind me saying so, are a little theoretical and fantastic, but he has the makings of a detective in him. Ah. But I do say, as I've said before, the Coburg branch of the bank is as well secured as any building in London. There's no possibility that you could be broken into. Even the insurance assessors agree on that point. And you, sir, should know, being not only the resident manager, but also the director. I should know, and I do know. And what is more, this is the first time for seven and twenty years that I've missed my Saturday night of whist at my club. Oh, dear. And I find myself extremely inconvenienced. I think that you will find the game tonight much more exciting, and the stake will be for many, many thousands of pounds. And what will my reward be, Mr. Holmes? A young man called Clay. John Clay? Oh, how I'd like to get my hands on that devil. You shall. This young fellow's a gentleman, as Mr. Holmes says, but he's turned against his class. He's as cunning as the devil, slippery as an eel, and he's turned crib-cracking and forgery into a fine art. His grandfather was a royal duke, and he himself was educated at Eton and Oxford. So, Watson, bring the gun. Come, gentlemen. Our cab is below.
have two keys to the vault. I have one. The chairman holds the other in his personal safe. Well, you are certainly not vulnerable from above. Nor from below. Mr. Manuel, may I ask you to be a little more quiet? sit on one of those boxes and not to interfere. There is no way in which a thief could break into this bank. Is it a special reason why a thief should want to break into this bank? Um, nothing particularly. Uh... Something in the past few months. Something that you have concealed from her. The information I have is confidential, known only to the directors of the bank. It is not to be divulged to members of the public. Not even amateur detectives. Private consulting detective, Mr. Merriweather. Unique in the annals of crime, I believe. Isn't that so, Inspector? Yes, Doctor. I advise you to cooperate with Mr. Holmes. Especially as at this moment I am trying to save your skin and that of your fellow directors. So what is it? Our French gold. We had occasion some months ago to strengthen our resources and borrowed for that purpose 60,000 Napoleons from the Bank of France. Therefore, our reserve of bullion is much larger than is usual in such a branch of the bank. Where is this gold? The crates upon which Dr. Watson sits contain 30,000 Napoleons wrapped between layers of lead foil. May we see it? Adventure or spur of the moment criminal. This long planning is not clay style at all, sir. Not at all. <laughs> 
But less is a pawn. How much larger can you? Mr. Merriweather, someone has had access to information of the most confidential sort. Careful plans have been laid. A mastermind has been at work. Are you suggesting that... I'm suggesting that it bears all the hallmarks of Professor Moriarty's work. Moriarty. We don't really know, sir. Well, that is, neither the police nor, I think, Mr. Sherlock Holmes have ever set eyes on him. Yet his name echoes and re-echoes throughout the underworld. It appears that he is a man of good birth and excellent education. But he has hereditary tendencies of the most diabolical kind. A criminal strain runs in his blood, which is increased and rendered infinitely more dangerous by his extraordinary mental powers. He is the organizer of half that is evil and nearly all that is undetected in this great city. He is never caught. His agent is caught, but the central power is never caught. Seldom even suspected. We shall not see the professor tonight. The only way for tonight's enemy to escape is through the pawnbrokers. There's already an inspector and a constable at the doors. Jump! It's no good, John Clay. You have no chance at all.
so I see. Though I fancy my pal is all right. At this moment, he is running into the welcoming arms of the police. You seem to have done the thing very completely. I must compliment you. And I you. I'm Sherlock Holmes, a private investigator. I didn't for a moment suspect you of being a policeman, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> Come on, hold out while I fit the derbies. I beg you to take your filthy hands off me. You may not be aware that I have royal blood in my veins. And be so kind as to say sir and please when you address me. All right. Would you please, sir, mind marching upstairs, where we'll get a cab to transport your highness to the police station? That's better. Gentlemen. Oh, one question, Mr. Clay. Am I right in thinking that Professor Moriarty was somewhere behind the idea of the Red-Headed League? I suggest you keep that name off your lips, Mr. Holmes, if you value your future well-being. Really, gentlemen, I, I don't know what to say. Please forgive me, Mr. Holmes, for ever doubting your outstanding, your brilliant qualities. There is no doubt you have detected and defeated in the most complete manner one of the boldest attempts at bank robbery that has ever come within my experience. Mr. Merriweather, I have been of some small expense over this matter, which I shall expect the bank to refund. Uh, of course, of course. Sorry we failed you. Sherlock Holmes. Holmes is a mere amateur in the field of detection. Still, he seems a clever man. Or a lucky one. And he has a positive talent for getting in my way. Should he be removed? That may be necessary. It would be disappointing. I find him interesting. I believe this is the third time he has incommoded me. If this continues, then certainly something will have to be done to encourage Mr. Holmes either to withdraw or stand clear. Watson. This has all been too much for me. My, my clients respect me as a man of confidence, but, but where's the confidence left here? I'm utterly ruined. Oh, cheer up, Mr. Wilson. You'll feel better when you've cleared up the mess. Yeah, well, that's all very well. And Mr. Holmes asked me to give you this. 50 sovereigns, with the compliments of the city and suburban bank. <laughs> well, that's fair enough. Oh, Dr. Watson, this is more than acceptable. I... And my compliments to Mr. Sherlock Holmes. And he sends the same to you, Mr. Wilson. And a word of advice. Next time you engage an assistant, pay him the proper wage. 
Good day to you. I trust I am not more dense than my neighbours, and yet here I have seen what you have seen, heard what you have heard, and yet you have seen clearly not only what had happened, but what was about to happen, while to me the whole business was still confused and grotesque. Mr. Watson, recollect. When I heard that the assistant had come for half wages, it was obvious that he had some motive for securing the situation. Yes, but how did you know what his motive was? Had there been a woman in the house, I would have suspected immediately some vulgar intrigue. But when I heard from Mr. Wilson about the acid stain and the pierced ears, I knew that Vincent Spaulding and John Clay were the same person. But why was Clay there? The photography gave you the clue. Exactly. The cellar. He was working on something in the cellar. Something which took many hours a day. For two months on end, he was tunneling. But where to? When I tapped my stick on the pavement in the street that day, I was ascertaining whether the tunnel stretched in front or behind the building. It was in front, towards the bank. Could you tell me the way to the Strand from here? I recognized Clay oh, immediately and delayed him to have time to examine his knees. They spoke clearly of many hours of tunneling no doubt linking up with the maze of sewers beneath saxe coburg Square. When they closed the red-headed league offices, it was a sign they no longer cared about Jabez Wilson's presence. In other words, the tunnel was complete. And that they would make the attempt on the Saturday was just a guess. Wilson, you disappoint me. I never guess. Saturday is an excellent night for stealing bullion. It gives you a full day to escape. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Oh, you've reasoned it out beautifully, Holmes. It's so long a chain, and yet every link rings true. It saved me from ennui. You know, sometimes I think that my whole life is spent in one long effort to escape from the commonplaces of existence. No, no. You are a benefactor of the race, Holmes. Well, maybe it is of some little use after all. Ah. L'homme sérieux. Love. C'est tout. As Gustave Flaubert wrote to George Sand. <laughs>